Thank you very much for that introduction. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for having me here today. How many of you know someone who's afraid of math? Please raise your hand. Okay, that's almost all of you. When is the last time a number jumped out of, of the page and bit you? Or a polynomial punched you in the face? That doesn't happen. Yet, there is a fear of math. What happens when you get a question wrong? Somebody comes and tells you, why did you make a mistake? Now imagine I am the coach of a basketball team, and every time a player misses a shot, I say, why did you make a mistake? Very soon, the players will realize that the best strategy is to not take a shot. And in a few weeks, I'll have this incredible team that never makes a mistake. I go to my boss and I tell him he's all excited and we go to our first match. And what does my boss see? The players are dribbling around and around and around the court, never taking a shot. They lose the match. We come back and they say, we are not natural athletes. We are just failures. So I ask you, what is the opposite of failure? If you thought success, you have just fallen into the trap that society has laid for us. My players never failed. Did they succeed? The relationship between failure and success is this. Failure is the path and success is the destination. You may need to fail several times in order to succeed. So the next time somebody says, why did you make that mistake? Think to yourself, because I want to learn from the mistake and succeed. Now, I do not recommend you say this out aloud. It is logically perfectly correct, but you may come across as impertinent. We live in a complex world where you have to keep track of your logic along with the emotions of other people. What is the emotion of the parent of a four-year-old? With just the right inputs, my child will become Einstein. So the parent is standing there, wringing his hands, and asks the child, what is three plus four? And this poor child is trying to count with his fingers and trying to keep that little finger down there while moving on to the other hand. The parent has aspiration, but also the fear that that little finger might just pop out and he'll get the answer wrong. And there's anxiety. This anxiety has been transmitted to the child who now is perceiving that the future of the world rests on his ability to control that little finger. And it's not a pleasant experience. And there is sowed the first seed of the fear of math. Now the child is 12 years old. He's doing a problem in decimal multiplication. And the, child, and the parent is now cracking his knuckles there, looking at the question and just hoping to himself, please get that decimal point in the correct place. Don't let it go to the left, don't let it go to the right. And what the child is seeing is a large jumble of numbers and with a dot that actually is supposed to have a meaning. And he feels the anxiety and he decides, I don't like math. But he knows that society equates intellect 
to mathematical ability and he doesn't want to feel less intelligent. So he says, I am a science person. Why does society equate intellect to mathematical ability? If you know mathematics, you're intelligent. If you don't know mathematics, you're not intelligent. Why does society give us this feedback? A couple of centuries ago, society equated intellect to mastery of Latin. Sir Isaac Newton published the Principia Mathematica, his most famous work, in Latin. Latin was the language of science. If you did not know Latin, you did not have access to scientific literature. Today, it might sound almost comical that society equated intellect to mastery of Latin. Today, the language of science is mathematics. You want to express an idea precisely and quantitatively, you use mathematics. But Latin and mathematics are just tools. It is good to master a tool, but real intellect lies in understanding which tool to use, in what sequence, with what inputs. A handheld calculator can probably calculate the square root of a large number faster than most of us. But is it intelligent? You need to think about what tool to use and what inputs to give it. Let me give you a simple example. I have a question, this is a typical eighth grade question. Three men and four women complete a job in five days. Four men and three women take six days. How many days does one man take? The numbers are all small, and I'm sure every one of you can do the division and multiplication in your head. But what is the principle underlying this question? What sequence of operators do we use? Now imagine if I change this around and I try to solve it using a play. I have three boys, four girls standing here. I have four boys, three girls standing there. They perform the task while the audience watches. Will the answer jump out at you? Is that a better way of Putting this in perspective, perhaps. Perhaps two centuries from now, people will be saying, you know, back in the 21st century, they used to equate intellect to mathematical ability. Unbelievable. Perhaps. But for this century, if you make a mistake, someone's going to say, why did you make that mistake? So what is going on here? If you make a mistake, the adult now has to do something that, that was not anticipated. They have to spend time explaining something for you. This time was not budgeted. The emotional energy, the intellectual energy needed to solve this was not budgeted. What is the child thinking? They don't want me to make a mistake. They want me to conform. They want me to stay within my comfort zone. The textbook is always right. So if I uh, just memorize the textbook, uh, that might be the right answer. So the child diligently memorizes the textbook and confidently walks into the next math exam. And when the results come, the next seed of the fear of math has been sown. Have you heard of people have a fear of geography? A fear of history? The way our curriculum is structured for most subjects, you can get along pretty far by memorizing the textbook. 
when I was in 10th grade, I had real trouble with Hindi. So I memorized a textbook. And for every question, I reproduced the entire chapter, hoping that the examiner would see it as a wonderful preface to the answer, followed by the answer itself, followed by a nice conclusion. I passed, just barely. The problem with math is that if the answer is 15, you cannot say 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. That does not work. Math is like a pyramid. You're in ninth grade. At the top of a pyramid is a question like finding the number of bricks needed to build a wall. This depends on two eighth grade topics below that. Area volume, decimal multiplication. Decimal multiplication, in turn, depends on sixth grade topics, decimals and fractions. And it goes all the way down to first grade. If you attempt an advanced topic that depends on a prerequisite, and you have not internalized that prerequisite, it's not a nice feeling. It causes emotional dissonance. You feel a sense of guilt, you know, two years ago when I was supposed to have done my homework, I just didn't. And now it's coming back to haunt me. Three years ago when I was, study, when I was supposed to study for that exam, I went out and played. It's all my fault. You feel the guilt. It's not a nice feeling. The solution, though, is very simple. Go down to the brick and work on it. Internalize that topic, and very soon you will move back up. If you try to do area volume and you don't know where the decimal point is supposed to go, it's not a nice feeling. Just go back down there and you'll find you'll very, very quickly move right back up. The good thing about math is you can try and try and retry as many times as you like. So what I'm telling you now is make mistakes. Make mistakes and learn from them. Embrace failure because that is your path to expand your horizons and broaden your comfort zone. If you don't fail, you will be like my basketball team, dribbling around and around and around the court, never taking a shot. That doesn't lead you to success. Entrepreneurs today have a new mantra, fail fast. What that means is, go down a path, figure out whether it's right or wrong, what's right in it, what's wrong in it, fix what's wrong in it, and do it your way. This is about your way. Do it your way. Imagine you have to scale a 10-foot wall. You look around, you look at your neighbor, you see what footholds he's using, you use the same footholds, that'll get you up there. But you could also look, out, look around the wall and look for your own footholds that suit you the best. And if you're really ambitious, you could make a few footholds, all of your own, customized for you. Math is very similar. If somebody gives you a, the process, you can follow the process and get to the answer. But a better approach might be to look at the question, look at what are the underlying principles behind this question. Solve the question for yourself with your own tools, in your own way. Imagine if Spider-Man was teaching a class and his students were Superman, Elastigirl, and Captain America. There's that poor man stranded on a building that, who needs to be rescued. So Spider-Man says, we weave the web, we swing along, we grab him and get him back. 
And Superman is sitting there all dejected. I don't know how to weave a web. And Elastigirl is thinking, I can calculate theta, but uh, web, I don't know. And Captain America is standing with a shield, trying to wiggle it around. <laughs> no web. The class is dejected. They think of themselves as failures. They have low self-esteem. They cannot, they cannot proceed the way that has been prescribed. But they are superheroes. They each have their own power. Superman should fly and bring that man back, and Elastigirl should just stretch her hand out and get him, and Captain America should do something with that shield. <laughs> you are superheroes. Each of you has your own power. Develop that power. Develop your own technique. Develop your own style. Develop yourself. If you are afraid of math, you're in good company. All the Nobel laureates of the world and all the Fields medalists together are unable to solve certain mathematical questions. And there are just about seven billion people on this planet who find math hard at some level or another. So don't worry if you find math hard. Just go back down to the loose brick, fix it, and you'll move right back up. And while you're at it, shed all that emotional baggage that society has laid on your shoulders and blossom into the you, the wonderful you that you are. You're all extremely talented students, remarkably creative, and very intelligent students here at one of the best schools in the country. You will do incredibly well, and I wish you the very best. Thank you.